Mm, that's drunk. Before I dive into Nobunaga's ambition and Lord of Darkness on Super Nintendo, I want to give a shout out to Toyrific in Maplewood, Minnesota. Unfortunately, they closed down not too long ago, but back around 1998 or so, I went there to see what they had, and I remember asking the guy behind the counter about one of the sealed SNES games under the glass. I remember seeing Ultima Runes of Virtue 2, Romance of the Three Kingdoms 4, Wall of Fire, but the one that caught my attention was called Lord of Darkness, only I didn't know how to pronounce the first part of the title, so I ended up saying something like Noah Bunga? The guy behind the counter let loose the heaviest of sighs and mustered all his retail training and expertise to politely inform me, <sighs> It's Nobunaga's ambition. Anyway, let's start with the first game, Noah Bunga. I mean, Nobunaga's ambition is similar to Genghis Khan 2, which I covered last week. The big focus here is on combat, and things are streamlined in a way that you can really crank through these scenarios while still maintaining a decent amount of control that's not too overwhelming. The setting is 16th century feudal Japan, and the fall of Shogun Ashikaga Yoshimasa has caused chaos where every daimyo, or warlord, is fighting for territory, resources, and influence. And you know, I get a lot of comments from people asking, how can you stand playing these boring-ass Koei games back to back to back? Well, once you've played one of them, then you understand the basic principles behind most of the others. So rather than just dryly list all the stuff unique to this game, I thought I'd just walk you through how I play these games, and how the Nobunaga's ambition titles in particular can be optimized in a way that help give this game a barely, kinda, sorta, pick-up-and-play quality to it. Okay, not really, and I do make liberal use of the fast-forward function if I'm playing this any way I can, but you can blaze through a scenario in less than two hours, and it's actually kinda fun once you get into it. I should mention quickly that the first game is compatible with the Super Nintendo mouse, but I am using a controller. First, it's always smart to take advantage of the unlimited number of rolls you get at the beginning here. It may take a minute, but it's possible to end up with all five numbers being more than 90. The next thing you want to do is pick the easiest map to manage with the fewest number of regions, or fiefs as they're called here. You'll want to pick the first scenario, it's only got 17 regions, so an entire playthrough should only take a couple hours or so, as long as you remember to select no when asked if you want to watch the battles. The other three scenarios here have 50 regions crammed together on this nightmare of a map, so in other words, you have to really, really like this game to dive into those. I'm not sure I do, so I'll stick with just the first scenario for now. Next, switch the message speed to 1 and turn off battle animations. Then, when gameplay starts up, priority 1 is to start getting money, just like every other Koei strategy game, and you do that by taxing your people, so set that to about 50 or so. That's all you can do in one turn, so then you just sit and wait for everyone else to have their little temper tantrums before it's your turn again. Just roll through a couple days, let the gold accumulate, and keep building loyalty with your soldiers and citizens by giving them rice and gold. You occasionally want to recruit and train, and once your army is big enough to attack, make sure to buy tons of rice, and then send a spy to take a gander at which region to invade, and pick the one with the weakest stats. And with one battle, we've taken over that region, and it's on to the next one. Each battle has a 30-day time limit, and if you go past that, your troops will get too exhausted to continue. That can be challenging to deal with when you've got maps like this, where it takes like a week to get all the way over there where my opponent is. But one thing you can do to make things easier is to pour everything into one single cavalry unit and just wreck everyone that way. The battle ends when one side either retreats, runs out of rice, or their command unit is killed. But that's the basic gist of how this game works. There's a lot more subtle balancing tricks you can take advantage of, and you can also create alliances through marriage, by a signed pact, or a simple bribe. There's plenty of the usual detail-oriented Koei stuff here too, like creating towns and taking out loans, but I just wanted to show you how to get going in such a dense game like this. Nobunaga's Ambition remains a solid game for this style, and it cuts a decent pace, but as usual with Koei, you're almost always going to want to play the later versions of their games, like in this case, it is... Nobunaga's Ambition, Lord of Darkness, released in October 1994. The original title translates to Nobunaga's Ambition, Records of the Generals, but the North American subtitle is Lord of Darkness. Just a bit of a contrast there, and it makes me sad that this game doesn't star this Lord of Darkness. But man, you think Koei knew their stuff when it came to PC ports? Here, we've got a friggin' taskbar with drop-down menus. It's like they had to install Windows 3.1 on a Super Nintendo cartridge. The same structure is here, buried underneath all this stuff somewhere. The detail here compares to another Koei effort, Pacific Theater of Operations, which I consider to be the most Koei game of any on the SNES, and Lord of Darkness is up there too. If PTO is a 10 on the Koei scale, then Lord of Darkness is at least an 8 or a 9. You know how I said the first game is somewhat manageable? Well, Lord of Darkness buries you with an avalanche of stuff. 
There's only two scenarios here, and they're both very long. This is easily a 30-hour game when it's all said and done. The first is the easiest, and the second cranks up the difficulty. Again, rather than rotely listing every single mechanic in the game, I'll just give some simple examples in the middle of gameplay. In battles, you have the option to either blitz, which destroys a unit no questions asked, or you can do the normal attack, which gives you a chance to recruit, release, or execute the commander of that unit if you defeat it. Some people refuse to be recruited, but once someone agrees, then you gotta give them something to do. Like for instance now, we just won that battle and took over this region's soldiers and resources. We can spread those around to other regions, or we can take this boatload of rice here, pick the general we've just recruited, and start to butter up some other regions by selling them some rice. And of course, as you do this, you always have to maintain the stats of the generals too, by keeping them fed and paying them to keep up their loyalty. What you decide to do with each region will bring about different results, like if you decide to focus one region on commerce and education, then you'll get people like this guy that wants to sell you a painting, and if your general is low on charm and intellect, you can boost it by paying 500 gold for a uh, flower picking adventure. Yeah, that'll make people think you're cool. You know what else wins you friends? Tea ceremonies. Yeah, you can ally with other regions by having tea with them. But what they think of you depends on how fancy your tea game is. No, really, if you bring cheap, crappy tea, you might as well be telling them how much you love Nickelback. If that fails, you can always send one of your kids over to be married and force people to be your friends that way. So yeah, you just try something out, you get the results, you make adjustments, stuff happens, you react, and it goes on like that for hours and hours. It can get kind of frustrating because the computer seemingly never ever runs out of money, and it's apparently playing by a different set of rules that you have to abide by. But for the most part, this one offers a good challenge without being too ridiculous, as opposed to games like Operation Europe, it's just really long and really dense. Like, the reason this game takes so long isn't just because of the user interface or the game performance itself, it's because you really have to be fully prepared before each battle. You have to calculate how much rice and how much gold is needed for each region and each unit, all while training and recruiting more units, and if you're not really thorough with this process, you will lose. The computer does not hold back. As usual with long-ass games like this, the music makes a huge difference, and thankfully the soundtrack in Lord of Darkness is outstanding. So yeah, Nobunaga's Ambition and Lord of the Darkness are well-made games, obviously, and as usual, the recommendation always comes down to whether or not you're into this sort of thing, where video games become an endless board game. The first game is much, much easier to fly through, it's more focused, and I found myself having fun with it. It helps that it provides plenty of little things that you might be amused by, like, wait a minute, this dude is 31 years old? Well, I guess people just looked older back then. Maybe this is an ancestor of Pirates catcher Mike Lavalier, who is also somehow only 31 years old in this picture. So while I like the first game, the second game, Lord of Darkness, is friggin' daunting. It's one of those games where you have to stop almost everything else you're in the middle of playing so you can focus your attention entirely on diplomatic missions and tea ceremonies. Now, if you're into games like this, Lord of Darkness is absolute top-notch. It's really well made, the interface is player-friendly once you figure out what all the abbreviations mean, and it packs a ton of content in what should easily make for a 30 or 35 hour playthrough. That's not for everyone, obviously, but if you're still curious about these games, the series is still going on today, with Nobunaga's Ambition Awakening being released for PS4, Switch, and Windows just a couple years ago. But yeah, the first game on SNES can be optimized so you can fly through a scenario, which can be fun, but the second game shoves you into the deep end for better or for worse, so while it's a top-notch production, your mileage on that one can vary a bit. And that is all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.